ഹായ് ഓൾ വെൽക്കം ടു കോഡിംഗ് ടോക്സ് പോഡ്കാസ്റ്റ് വിത്ത് മൈ സെൽഫ് വിഷ്ണു വി ജി ദ കോഡിംഗ് ടോക്സ് ഇസ് എ ടെക്നോളജി പോഡ്കാസ്റ്റ് വിച്ച് കവേഴ്സ് എ വൈഡ് റേഞ്ച് ഓഫ് ടെക്നോളജി ടോപ്പിക്സ് ഫ്രം പ്രോഗ്രാമിംഗ് ടു ക്ലൗഡ് കമ്പ്യൂട്ടിംഗ് ദ ഇൻറ്റൻഷൻ ഓഫ് ദിസ് പോഡ്കാസ്റ്റ് ഈസ് ടു ഗിവ് ദ ഓഡിയൻസ് എ ഫെമിലിയാരിറ്റി അബൌട്ട് different technology topics out there one of the interesting thing that you can observe in information technology field is that the technologies change at a rapid pace so that demands a lot of pressure on ourselves as developers as well as those who interested to know about technology they need to learn constantly so my intention is to share some of the knowledge that i know and it doesn't matter whether you are an experienced programmer or not if you are interested in learning and if you have a curiosity to learn some of the technology topics the podcast will benefit you a lot so all are welcome about myself i am a .net programmer from tiruvannadapuram kerala state Tiruvannadapuram is a beautiful city located on the southernmost part of India. About my programming background, I have experience working with different .NET technologies and front-end technologies and also experience working with the different cloud platforms like Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, GCP and so on. I am a community builder for AWS Storage. In addition to this podcast, which will be available on all leading podcast platforms, I will be conducting sessions on Meetup Group. The name of the Meetup Group is Coding Talks Cloud Computing. If you are interested in learning from me, I suggest you to subscribe to that Meetup Group as well as my YouTube channel. The name, YouTube channel name is also the same as this podcast. coding talks with vishnu vj so if you subscribe to that meetup group and uh, youtube channel you will get notifications of the upcoming sessions so that's all about me and my technical background now let's dive into the topic of today's discussion it's about micro services those who were regularly listening this podcast they know that i have covered a few of the architecture related sessions earlier and in that i covered some details about microservices and many of you might be already familiar with what a microservice is all about but in this episode i would like to present microservices from the ground up to give you some familiarity of what it is all about also if time permits in this episode we will look at some advanced topics like the implementation how uh, how to implement the microservices for a new applications as well as to migrate existing application as well as the different development strategies and deployment strategies as well if time didn't permit me to kind uh, to include that in this episode that will be a different episode as well so stay tuned with this podcast the reason for the relevance of microservice as of now is that i can see those who are interested in application development whether they are beginner or experienced professionals they prefer to work in some of the technologies like docker kubernetes and so on so these are all these docker kubernetes these different cloud services like aks eks uh, azure kubernetes services elastic kubernetes service and all on uh, and the different container registry services these are all the kind of supporting technologies that are somehow related to microservices even the recent trendy word like the serverless concept where you don't need to bother about the infrastructure at all and also the function as a services plat- services which you can see in different cloud vendors that are also somehow related to microservices so these services facilitate or support microservices architecture 
In fact, one can say that the buzzwords like the Docker Kubernetes evolved this much for the effective implementation of microservice architecture. This brings to a question why a developer prefers microservice architecture for development developing applications. To understand this, we need to go to the basics. We are all familiar with a tra traditional form of development called monolith architecture. In monolith architecture, developers simply develop an application on a single code base. This is very easy to understand. Think about the days you start your started your programming journey. Those days you had no familiarity with architecture and you developed your application in a single code base. This type of development is kind of a monolithic architecture. Might be if you developed that application a bit further and if you had given that kind of application to some, some of the clients. So this is just an example for you to understand. Imagine that you had, uh, think that you had developed such an application and you had given that to a client. The good thing is that your application worked effectively and it becomes popular. So you need someone else to help you with your application and one of your friend might be an expert in these different kinds of ar architectures. So naturally uh, to evolve your application further, your friend might have uh, architected your application a bit further. So he might be improved it further by splitting your application into different tiers or we can call this in programming as layered architecture. Back in 2006, when I started development, developing application, this kind of architecture like the layered or tiered architecture was so popular. Every application we open, uh, whether it's a .NET uh, application windows application or a, an asp.net application we can see three different layers there one will be the presentation layer which is responsible for presenting the application second one is like the business layer where the associated business logic uh, is there uh, associated with where the different business logics are there and then the database layer which is responsible for connecting to different database services and all. So if you ask then some of uh, those who are developing such an architecture, they would be uh, saying that this kind of splitting of, of applications into different layers uh, help in maintaining the application as well as if you want to change something. Say for example, if you want to change the database layer, they can easily do that from the database layer itself without affecting the other layer. So this this is fine. So this is a kind of a sp splitting up of different uh, lay, uh, uh, splitting up of application into different tiers or layers. And there will be usually two to three layers ideally. And some of the application have a fourth layer as well. One of the common thing that you can observe in this type of layered architecture is this is based on a this splitting is based on technology stack. So if you look into this, the presentation layer will ideally be some kind of JavaScript related libraries and the business layer will be kind of some kind of uh, business layer where uh, someone who are who have a familiarity with C sharp uh, will be working in and a team will be working on that layer and coming to the database layer someone who might be a database expert will be working in that layer so this is like a splitting up of an application into distinct layers based on technology so that's the key important uh, and, um, feature of a layered architecture 
where the slicing is based on a technology stack. However, it is still a monolith because you will be deploying that together. Uh, if uh, when it went further uh, through the use of different mappings, we can split the different layers independently and each layer can be deployed independently into a different server. Then uh, th that uh, deployment will be uh, happening uh, independently. So that would be fine. But still, if you want to change something on a front end side uh, or to add a new feature to your application the challenge with this kind of layered architecture is that you need to change that in three different areas that's the problem also when react team came up with an react architecture they mentioned like the mvc is fine but if you want to change something or a new feature or if you want to remove a feature you need to change that in three distinct areas. So instead of focusing on one area, you need to uh, focus on three different areas. So that was a challenge with this layered architecture. So it's basically a bit further than a monolith, but still it's a kind of a monolith where independent deployability was still a problem there. So there is a tight coupling exists there. We feel like there is reduced coupling, but in reality, there is more coupling. Especially when, as you can notice, when you need to make some change, you need to change three different areas. So layered or tired approach based on technology help to an extent some form of development and also for maintaining the application. But uh, there was more scope for development and thus evolved other form of uh, architectures like the modular monolith and before we move further into uh, understanding the modular monolith as well as the microservices we need to uh, think about this layered architecture a bit more actually this layered architecture uh, is an evolvement uh, of the famous convoys law if you search it, the convoys law you will get the definition so this is an uh, convoys law says that organization which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organization so I, there will be some form of communication structure or organizational structure inside these organization and this uh, layering architecture based on this technology stack is a direct representation of that so we can think like this this layered architecture is a kind of an implementation of convoys law and this helped organization to a great extent especially to group related technology people like db teams dotnet teams and so on so like i said earlier the database layer can be uh, developed and maintained by the db teams so it's not bad it's a kind of an optimized system based on technology and skill however still if you observe it clearly you can view that it's still a silo form of development because software development evolved further from there and it demands a group of multi-skilled people or we can say like poorly skilled people uh, which are a requirement for every team. So instead of having a set of database developers working in on remote areas as a silo, there should be a team which, which have multi-skilled people, preferably a database developer, maybe a C-sharp developer, maybe a front-end developer and so on. So such a combination of a poly-skilled team people is part the modern modern software uh, um, engineering required and organization also required such kind of approach and so this convoys law implementation based on technology stack didn't serve that purpose and so the modular uh, so the uh, monolith and the layered architecture was not a good fit and it didn't scale up that level as we expect so uh, the a further evolve evolution happened from there and that's the concept of modular monolith so in modular monolith the code inside the 
process that the a single process is divided into different modules like module a module b and so on and you can see that for many organization not all for some type of organization the modular monolith can be an excellent choice if the module boundaries are well defined uh, it allows a high degree of parallel work but at the same time it avoids the challenges of a more distributed microservice architecture by having a simpler deployment topology you can understand about this modular monolith and it's some of the benefits by uh, google uh, the term shopify space uh, modular monolith so there is an article which is presented by shopify which is an organization and they say that they have used this technique as an alternative to microservice decomposition and they mentioned that it seems to work really well for that company the one reason why they are mentioning is like we just discussed about the monolith where everything related to the application is tied inside a single code base so that is monolith and we also going to discuss not discuss that we also going to discuss about microservices where an application is divided into distinct modular services which are independently deployable so in between there is a architecture called modular monolith where a single monolith uh, uh, and its process is divided into different modules so the advantage here shopify mentions is that uh it it allows them to maintain the entire code base in one place and they can deploy that to a single place so they are saying that deploying the application the shopify application to single place has many advantages one of the benefit they are mentioning is like they need to maintain only one repository and they can easily search and find all functionality in one folder so in addition to that because of this kind of architecture shopify only have to maintain one test and deployment pipeline and thus they can avoid a lot of overhead because according to them the pipelines can be expensive to create customize and maintain so Uh, if code is deployed in one application and the data can live all in a single sh- sh- shared database a, da- a simple database query can help to retrieve it and also the network traffic is very fast in modular monolith because uh, everything is there in a single place deployed to a single place so there is no uh, question of network latency and all happen as in case of microservices and also the avoiding the network and the communication over apis uh, so they don't have to bother about the api version management and backward compatibility and all and also as well as the delay in the network call so these are some of the benefits which shopify mentioning in their article if you are interested to read the exact article i suggest you to search for shopify s h o p i f i space modular monolith where that that article itself give you a clear and good picture about this modular monolith so i recommend you to go through that by going through that article you will get an idea about all that i discussed now that is about the monolith modular monolith as some of the advantages as well as uh, you will get a little bit familiar about microservices as well i will explain more about microservices soon but i suggest you to bookmark that link uh, and um, have a look at it so it's give a clear picture and another thing is like because shopify mentioned that uh, modular monolith is best for them it doesn't means that that is the ideal choice for different organization different form of architecture is what required it's based on the requirement of the application how much scalability we want and what are the different changes that we expect in our application 
based on that we need to ascertain so lot of factors are there we will uh, discuss all that uh, soon so uh, so that you should keep in mind while we discussing about microservices or uh, its predecessors like the um, this uh, modular monolith or monolith uh, don't have a feel like this will be the one that i should choose nowadays we can see that lot of developers who are new to information technology they when they are joining some project they prefer something like docker or something and naturally the development leads uh, who want to take advantage of the newest things they prefer some kind of microservice form of development but as you can see in the famous book building microservices by sam newman if you go through that book you can understand that even though he recommend microservices and lot of its advantages still microservices is not a good fit for every kind of application the one reason for that is that while microservices gives you independent deployability uh, the less coupling and um, parallel development and lot of other benefits uh, still it comes at the cost of many factors like uh, one thing is like you need to have an infrastructure to maintain the different microservices you need to be aware of the network delays that can happen between your microservice code and you need to mitigate all those things and a microservice should be developed in such a fa- way that it should be resilient if one service fails it should recover immediately once it's back and all the other services should understand that the service has failed and the next time when it is back it should recover from there so this way there will be less coupling between services and each services must be resilient and there must be proper service boundary defined to split the application into different modules so if you understand microservices simply you can search about google uh, search in google about microservice architecture and you will get a lot of definitions uh, one of the definition i will read so it is like this a microservice is uh, services an independently deployable component of bounded scope that support interoperability through message based communication microservice architecture is a style of engineering highly automated evolvable software systems made up of capability aligned microservices so this definition looks like a bit complex if you extract some of the terms from there one of the main unique feature of microservice is the independent deployability like like as in the case of a monolith we have a single application in a single code base so here based on business domain that is the key factor you should consider for splitting up a microservice remember it's not based on technology uh, stack we talked about layered architecture where we split the application based on technology stack so that is the entire and layered architecture so that is not the case with the microservices in microservices we split the application based on the business domain so domain driven design is a basic helpful pattern for this kind of splitting so once you understand a proper domain and once you split and uh, uh, once you define a service boundary you can convert that boundary into a microservice and your application will be having a lot of such microservices which works independently and will be communicating through some mechanism through some api and then together with that it all works together in isolation f- for uh, in such a way that it can withstand some of the uh, user demands and all S- 
so there are different definitions out there and one thing you can consider uh, easily for understanding microservices independent deployability so if you are developing an application and you feel that it should be developed as a microservice one then independent deployability is an indispensable component of that uh, characteristics of that microservice and as a development team you should be able to deploy specific part of your application we call that as modules without affecting the other parts so that modules should have scalability scalability means that each module should have the necessary scalability to meet user demands and also it must be resilient so that in case if it, if it fails it should automatically recover on sit back to make this all happen as a developer you have to develop the application in a different way as opposed to monolithic or modular monolith the splitting is very important here the split of application into different modules based on the business domain that is the key factor there we will discuss soon how we can split our application or how we can convert our existing monolithic application to such associated microservices now before we think about whether to develop an application in microservice architecture or not based on the def definitions we understand we can relate that to an example of a of an of a general world example that we can see we all use applications like amazon shopping website as well as the audio service like spotify if you look into this kind of application you can see that there are different domains out there say for example in the case of amazon you can see that there are different domains like shopping cart then the payments warehouse rewards and so on and you can also see some of the other things like recommendation area and all so these are all isolated components or modules and which are working independently and the developers of amazon shopping had made it in a such a fashion that each component of that particular application or we can call that as a a domain so that uh, part will be handled by a microservice and together all the di these different services work in uh, coordination without depending on each other and that way they will cater the demands of the user to take an example if you are using amazon website sometimes if when you add the different items in cart and in your wish list and once you began to make a payment think that if the bank api is down then that payment service won't work as we think but it doesn't affect the other areas of the website like the shopping or the recommendation service or anything so this is the characteristics of a microservice architecture where it can work independently without depending on each uh, depending on other service even though we see amazon as a single website we should understand that th that's a combination of different modular services which are working in parallel without without having any relation uh, and that way they are catering the needs of the users so there uh, you should understand that even though it doesn't have a direct relation still it must be communicating with other service through the uh, api and all so that is why once you trigger once you shop something and when you click the buy button it will be triggering some of the different services behind the scene and each service will be working in isolation 
so if the payment service failed currently it will do a retry after some time but that's the responsibility of the payment service and if an architecture can be evolved like this for your application as well then the advantage that such a kind of microservice architecture would bring to you as a developer and for your team as well as for the application as a whole is like this kind kind concept of modularity so each module can be deployed independently it can be scaled independently sometimes imagine if you need uh, if more users are visiting the website through uh, during a sales day or some other important day then you can scale a particular area like the shopping service or the uh, card service to further based on the user demands and without affecting the other areas so that's the key here independent scalability and independent Uh, recovery from failure these all are some of the characteristics and also for the development team because we here we are slicing the application based on business domain and an entire a to z related to that domain can be served by a single team so that reduces dependency for example this payment services can be handled by a sim a uh, candle by a team of say example five five to 10 developers who might be expert in uh, developing payment related services and they can focus on their part without depending on other services and similarly the recommendation service developers who might be an expert in artificial intelligence or machine learning where they can leverage some of those concepts to here and they can develop their particular area So these are the advantages that it brings to developer as well as for the application as a whole. Now think about that early layered architecture we just thought about or you can think about that modular monolith or some monolith architecture where you all developers will be working together and if someone make a change in one area it will affect the other person. So these are things you should uh, you can understand how it easy uh, facilitates the development and also uh, in the case of a website like spotify where um it's it's split into different modules and one of the user visible module like the front end will be handled by a ua team who is expert in front end technologies like react so they can use their knowledge to bring out the best beautiful user interface as they can whether while the behind the scene things like the payment and other related areas can be handled by a separate team so this means less coordination is required between teams and that's one of the advantages that this microservice bring to a developer and in addition to that scalability reliability and other things are also another considerations uh, think about the scalability concept think that you deployed an entire monolith to a server and think that one particular area uh, got overused and it consumes a lot of the user resources and uh, a lot of the machine resources because everything is deployed in a single machine that means it affects the other components as well so if one process consumes a lot of the server resources and if other components are also deployed in that same machine as in the case of a monolith or in the as in the case of a modular monolith that means it affects the application at all that won't happen in the as in the case of uh, that won't happen in the case of microservices so this comes at a cost as well so that is why sam newman who is an expert in the field of microservices mentioned this in his book so even though these are all 
uh, the, some of the benefits of microservices still building an application using a microservice architecture is really a challenge especially because it's a distributed kind of services where each services have no direct relation with other service so we need a logging mechanism as a prerequisite there to understand what is happening behind the scene unless we have a proper logging mechanism to understand what is happening behind the scene existing advance it's not an afterthought it should be there before we start developing the microservice architecture so without a proper logging in place it will be difficult to trace what is happening in microservice architecture especially when we discuss we uh, we will discuss about the communication that is happening between these microservices we will encounter a term called asynchronous communication where it's communicate where is microservice communicate with other microservice not directly but through a queue or something the reason why we put a queue in between is that if one microservice fails still that message will be there in the queue and when the next micro when that microservice recovers it can get that message from the queue and it can do a processing so that won't happen if one microservice directly contacts another and if that microservice fails it will fail this microservice as well so to avoid that uh, in the areas we see that we should establish an asynchronous communication we use something like a queue or a topic so the uh, coming to all these the idea is that asynchronous asynchronous form of communication do uh, can happen and that brings a challenge for the developers or the operations team as to identify what is happening behind the scenes so a proper aggregation of the different logs or a coordinated logs aggregation mechanism should be in place before attempting to fully convert an existing application to microservices even if one develop an uh, microservice still an logging mechanism as a prerequisite will be very helpful otherwise it will be very difficult to understand what is happening behind the scene so we'll discuss more about that logging mechanism and all a bit later next uh, we can think about how we can define service boundaries and how we can split an application into different modules if you read through the book of sam newman which is building uh, microservices uh, and that's available from orally publication you can see that sam newman suggest on to uh, to approach this microservices development incrementally this means that if you have a monolith application and if you fully analyze the application and if you feel that you need to convert that into a microservice architecture you need to do that incrementally so there are different patterns he mentioned in that book in his book and one of that book one of the pattern is called a strangler pattern where you extract a certain part of your application where you feel that it can be converted to microservices and then you will redirect the calls related to that particular area to the new service so this way you will be incrementally extracting each part of the monolith until the finally uh, you fully switch over to the new services so that is one approach called the strangler pattern strangler fig pattern so if you search strangler fig pattern you can understand about that so that is a kind of an incremental approach which one can follow to convert an existing application to microservices and uh, sam newman's another one important um, uh, mentioning in that book is like uh, even though many were thinking like uh, because of the advent of docker uh, serverless and different cloud technologies out there still the de facto standard for starting any any kind of application especially if you are not familiar with an architecture is still the monolith because the monolith has the scope for to convert that to a microservice later so if you are not familiar with what you want to go ahead with a microservice then starting off with a monolith can really help and also uh, another important point he mentioned is like 
before understanding fully about a business domain if you start developing micro service architecture you will be baffled so uh, to effectively define the service boundary and split the application into different modules it needs some time to understand the different entirety of the application and the different business domain and all only then we will be able to split out and extract that into a service the uh, the main characteristics of uh, the microservice modules is that high cohesion means that if you look into a service say for example a payment service it will be cohesive it means that all the different uh, codes that are related to payment will be embedded in that service itself so it's kind of an encapsulation and uh, that will be uh, transparent to other that will be uh, uh, transparent to other services so other services will be conducting this payment service only through an api and everything about what is happening inside that payment and everything is hidden within the payment service itself so that way the proper grouping of or co- we can call that as cohesive kind of an um, approach cohesive uh, uh, is a characteristic that is must for an microservice module otherwise if you develop a module and some of its functionality split is there in another service it will be a problem so everything that you feel th- to group as a module or that to be li- that to be grouped inside a service boundary you need to group that effectively so that grouping can be possible only if you understand properly about the business domain so that's the reason why without understanding about the business domain if you convert an microservice to a uh, convert a monolith to a microservice and for new application in the earlier stages of development without fully knowing what all are the requirements that can happen so it will be a really a challenge because if once you develop an app mo- module later you are understanding that it should not be working in this way and some other way it should work and you need to group other areas as well so uh, it will be a real challenge so understanding f- properly about the different business domain Uh, that are related to that application is a key challenge in developing the developing with a new microservice or as well as converting the existing microservices and to convert uh, to convert the existing monoliths to microservices first we need to think whether that kind of conversion is required or not so sam has said in the book like if there is a trivial application for a poc or some purpose and which is just for a demonstration attempting that to be a microservice architecture would be an overkill and if there are developers within uh, 5 to 10 for an application then that then also uh, converting that to a microservice didn't help but if you feel that your application has a scope for further development then microservice architecture can help so proper analysis is one thing that you need to be aware of you can read in about that uh, more details in that book so these are some of the key points which i mentioned next thing is like how can we split the application so if you want to split the application there are different ways to do that so one of the initial approach where i am going to explain here is a process called seed process so the idea of seed process is like we will be identifying the different apis that are related to an application so why api means that in microservice every module will be contacting to other services through an api so we think an application from an api perspective or application programming uh, interface perspective so that's the main idea of this seed process so seed is a, a kind of a process you can search that in uh, in the uh, what to say like uh, in the um, google and it will give a good picture about the seed process at all so the uh, the step is a bit different like uh, we first analyze the application and we 
think about the application in terms of APIs. And once that API is confirmed, APIs are properly defined, then we should think that there is an associated uh, related microservice module that lies behind that API. So there we define properly the uh, microservices. So that's one concept. So uh, again, I am telling that process that is called seed, S-E-E-E-D. And the process is like, first you, uh, I will give a quick overview about that process. First, it is like you identify the actors that are involved in interactions within your application. So they, they are called the actors. And based on their actions, what the actors do, we identify or derive a higher level actions. Okay. Once you define a derive a high level actions, then we will be defining an API based on that. So if you take the example of a modular shopping website, and if you think in terms of actors, we can see that there are different customers out there and they will be contacting to the system. So we will form some of the higher level actions like the payment, shopping, the uh, cart, um, adding to cart and also once you uh, form a, a set of derive a high level actions, we can define an API behind that and then uh, behind that we can create an associated modular service. So that's the concept of seed process and seed process can help you to define some of these things and um, the the different APIs then that we can communicate with uh, each other and then they can together form an microservice architecture application. There is another way which is called the event storming. Event storming is also a method you can search in Google and which can be helpful to identify the service boundaries. So this is considered just like an exercise like sprint retrospective where everyone who are interested in the application sits together. So there are different kinds of event storming process. If you search in Google, uh, you can see like a main event storming process as well as a lightweight event storming process. Uh, so you can, um, it is recommended to use the lightweight event storming as, that, uh, as it helps to uh, discover some of the more aggregates in your subdomain uh, and with less complexity. So uh, to participate in this kind of event storming and uh, uh, um, to identify the different service boundaries, Everyone who is interested in uh, in this in our application should sit together. And the goal of the uh, exercise is to identify the events. So that's the first stage. So there is no coordination in this first stage. Uh, we will tell the different participants like, uh, please identify as many events as you can. So if it's a shopping website, Participants will be identifying the different events like payments, the shopping, then the uh, recommendation and max maximum events will be done. So this phase usually take around 30 minutes to an hour depending on the size of the problem and the number of participants. And all the different events that we are we captured from different participants are added to a sticky notes. And uh, it says that there should be a minimum of 100 events there for an application. Uh, it, so it's not a, a fixed number. It's like kind of a varying number. For an enterprise application, it's recommended like around 100 event sticky notes generated. But it varies according to your application. So this is the first stage we will capture from all the participants the different events that are related to our application. So if it's a new application, we will be thinking about that application and the possibility of the application and then generating the event. 
if you are converting a monolith to a microservice architecture then we will be defining the events based on the existing application for the existing application as we already have an application in place it will be easy to identify the events but in the case of other or a new application the participants needs to think about and visualize how the application will be like and then they will be creating the events so next the second phase of the exercise of event storming where the uh, where there is a facilitator who help to arrange these events into a more coherent timeline and also they identify the duplicates as we can see in the first phase we are we won't tell the participants like uh, you don't create an event which other created so uh, the only goal in the first session is to capture as many events as we can so there might be duplicates and in the second phase a facilitator helps to arrange these events into a more coherent timeline then they will create a storyline walking through the events in an order that create something like a user journey and naturally there are some questions like a user when we define a user story or a storyline based on these events naturally questions or confusion can happen but we kept it aside we won't solve in this phase i am explaining each stage on by on so this phase can also take up to around 1 hour depending on the context so next is the third stage which is called as reverse narrative so here we walk the timeline or the storyline backwards from end to the start and we identify the main command that caused the event so it's like for example if you uh, uh in the case of a shopping site if you submit the payment then we identify the set of different uh, main events that uh, that cause that particular st storyline or the timeline is this payment uh, submission or the payment authorization and based on that a set of uh, different events happen like the payment processing happen then the uh, bank return bank statement uh, bank return information happen and then the uh, payment success failed message happen so these all different events are captured based on that but we will identify the basic uh, command that actually caused the this particular event and you need to aware that a lot of commands will have on to on relationship with the event so there will be a lot of confusions that can happen at this st stage but we don't consider all that that we will just notify that so uh, we uh, we identify that a, sim a simple payment submission command will create a lot of related events like uh, mail sending and all but we just capture as it is then the, in the next phase we acknowledge the commands that do not produce events directly so there are a special type of domain entities which accept commands and produce events and these are called aggregates so what we do in this phase is to rearrange our commands and events breaking the timeline and based on aggregates we group it together so uh, for example there is a um, if you uh, consider about a shopping website after the shopping is over there will be a survey so based on that survey there will be a uh, survey there will be some a set of events like a leave a rating rate my experience 
then review of website and all the associated things so we will be grouping that uh, like there so this phase can takes up to around 50 to 25 minutes so once we are done everything we will be identify like we uh, our event storming final outcome has a set of time limits of events or we can see a cluster of events and commands grouped around associate aggregates so these are the different phases that are there in the event storming which helps to identify the boundaries so i will again explain about the different boundaries quickly to understand a bit more about these different aggregates you can check up the book like uh, there is one book that is published by O'Reilly, which is called Microservices Up and Running. So if you look into that book, you will get a detailed picture about how to define a, um, a service boundary using event storming. So a detailed description is presented in that book. And also it gives a good picture about that seed event and all. So I recommend, I suggest you to go through that book to get a full understanding about the different uh, event storming practices that you can work on so there are uh, totally five phases so first phase is like 30 minutes it's to identify as many events as we can and second phase is roughly took around uh, 45 minutes it's to identify the storyline and on the third phase we will create a reverse narrative and we will identify the main command that caused these events then on the fourth we will identify the bounded context or the aggregates and finally in the phase five we analysis uh, do an analysis based on all this and we identify the service boundaries so this event storming is believed to help uh, informing the service boundary properly so that's one of the advantage of having this uh, event storming exercise so and together with that seed it will help you accurately to identify the service boundaries there are other ways also you can take or consider like these are the these are two ways which i explained another way is like you can check out your monolith application or a, an application which you plan to do and think about whether there is a part of your application which has the possibility to change. So if you expect a change in one particular area of your application, you can extract it into a different service. And based on that, a team can work on that and they can develop that service independently without affecting any of the other service. If you remember I told earlier one of the main unique distinct feature of a microservice architecture is independent deployability. So that team who are working on that particular service can should have the provision to should have the uh, freedom or liberty to work on that module, develop it, test it, deploy it and without affecting any other components of the same application they should be able to deploy it so based on that if you analyze your application properly and if you feel that one area might need some change which can help your business then uh, extracting that to a microservice is another way instead of doing with this event storming so event storming and seed process are different techniques which are presented out there these are tools which can help So these are tools which can help, but the, these are not mandatory to have in micro in defining microservice architecture. And another thing you can think about is like if you feel a bottleneck in particular area of an application which needs some scalability, then you can extract that to a modular service. So this is the approach which uh, we can use to convert existing micro modular uh, existing monolith to microservices where 
we identify the areas that have the possibility to change as well as the possibility to uh, scale up then we will extract it and convert into a microservice and we can route the traffic to that microservice using based on that triangular pattern and finally um, that um, sam mentioned in his book like um there exist many application which have a set of monolith as well as microservices and uh that can also help uh, because we are thinking about microservices architecture it's not mandatory that we should be converting every part of the application to microservices so that may not be feasible because uh having a microservice architecture in place and it's to keep the infrastructure properly different mechanisms like a kubernetes and all are required so it may not be feasible for all projects and based on more you convert a monolith to a microservice the more cost for for maintaining and more complexity will arise so this one this is one area of complexity where the infrastructure complexity like how to maintain that application and maintain that modular microservice is uh, comes to you second one is like if something uh, happens inside that uh, m- microservice you need an uh, um, accomplishable logging mechanism also in place which can help to coordinate the different events out there so when i gone through an article i could see like there's a dashboard they have a set of microservices and they have a dashboard where it indicates exactly what these different microservices are doing and what an error where an error can happened so based on a coordination factor uh, they can able to identify at exactly what point that failure happened so this that was possible because they had a log aggregation mechanism in place from these different microservices that's the reason why sam newman has mentioned like we need a log aggregation as a prerequisite before we attempting to move the microservices because the more you move your my services to microservices the more the challenge will be so that's the area now let's talk about the communication that can happen between these microservices that is another area which where you, we can discuss usually the preferred way for communication between these microservices is like the through the case of a restful api and that's over an http but there are some new advancements came out like the grpc that's that's a, a remote procedure call based technology where it's a kind of an abstraction where uh, which is developed by google where the where the call is under uh, rerouted uh, where the call is routed under through an uh, a, the http2 protocol and that will be transparent to the that will be, will not be visible to the um, caller so you can have the different nuget packages for dotnet for including grpc i think in the newer versions of dotnet core it's actually there you can call the remote procedure using grpc services and it transfers the call based on http to protocol using binary format such as protobuf also graphql interfaces are also there which can help to communicate between the microservices but the default or the normal way for interacting with a microservice whether whether that microservice is interacting with each other or through other uh, different ways is through the restful api and it's based on http and it should be over the a secured connection like the ssl or tls 
so that's related to synchronous in uh, pattern of communication between microservices but on the other side we can have asynchronous uh, uh, communication as well like they publish subscribe type of interactions so in this interaction pattern the upstream can generate events and the downstream services can uh, subscribe to that events and they can do the processing so this means that the upstream services or the event generators can just trigger that event and they can forget other things and those other interested services or the downstream services can subscribe to it and they can do the work as they like so this kind of publish subscribe patterns are very complex to implement and debug but the advantage that bring to the microservices is like they offer a superior level of resiliency fault tolerance scalability and flexibility nowadays the cloud providers like aws and azure provides a lot of different services out there example is like the sns service simple notification service and sqs service the queue service where you can publish the event and the associate subscriber can subscribe to that similarly the azure service bus you can you can send to a queue and the interested parties can queue that item or also you can follow a, an asynchronous pattern like publish subscribe where an upstream service microservice will publish the event to a topic and then the interested parties can subscribe to there so there is less coupling happens in this case as opposed to a synchronous communication in the case of a synchronous communication the two microservices are contacting through some form of an uh, api like the http or through the uh, through some grpc calls but that communication is actually a synchronous if one service were not able to reply to that event the call fails so but synchronous is helpful in some situations like for example if you want to query something and want to show to user then synchronous communication will be effective while some of other kind of events like payment done or something then the shopping website can insert that information to a queue for a topic and the rest of the services can be read from the queue and or topic and can proceed accordingly so it depends on the what we want to achieve we can leverage whether we want a synchronous communication between the uh, different services or we need an asynchronous communication between the services so one thing i would like to mention here is like uh, grpc as uh, is good Uh, so if you look into the book by sam newman he he's mentioned like grp is good and it offers some of the possibilities of http2 and all but some of the things are abstract under the uh, some of the things are hired from the user under the grpc uh, mechanism so they won't get an actual picture of what is happening behind the scene so in the case of an http call we get an understanding like okay the service is calling that http and getting a return but when we abstract something using the grpc an underlying call is happening there so coming to the communication as we discussed there are different ways like the http rest api then the remote procedure calls like the soap or the grpc so this grpc it looks like the uh, remote uh, these are frameworks uh, allows to for local method calls to be invoked on a remote process then the uh, rest api is the default standard we can used for communicating with, between the microservices then there is a 
പ്രോട്ടോകോൾ കോൾഡ് ഗ്രാഫ് ക്യൂ എൽ വിച്ച് ഈസ് എ റിലേറ്റീവ്ലി ന്യൂ പ്രോട്ടോകോൾ ദാറ്റ് അലോസ് ദ കൺസ്യൂമേഴ്സ് ടു ഡിഫൈൻ കസ്റ്റം ക്വറീസ് ദാറ്റ് ക്യാൻ ഫെച്ച് ഇൻഫർമേഷൻ ഫ്രം മൾട്ടിപ്പിൾ ഡൗൺ സ്ട്രീം മൈക്രോ സർവീസസ് ആൻഡ് ദ കെയർ ഫിൽട്ടർ ദ റിസൾട്ട്സ് ടു റിട്ടേൺ ഓൺലി വാട്ട് ഈസ് നീഡഡ് ദെൻ ദർ ഇസ് അനദർ വേ ഓഫ് അസിങ്ക്രണസ് കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ ദീസ് റസ്റ്റ് എ പി ഐ ഗ്രാഫ് ക്യൂൽ ആൻഡ് ആർ പി സി ആർ ഓൾ സിങ്ക്രണസ് കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ വേർ ആസ് ദർ ഇസ് എൻ അസിങ്ക്രണസ് കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ കോൾ ദി മെസ്സേജ് ബ്രോക്കേഴ്സ് ദാറ്റ് അലോസ് ടു കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻ വയ ക്യൂ ഓർ ടോപ്പിക്സ് സം ഓഫ് ദ എക്സാമ്പിൾസ് ഓഫ് ദിസ് മെസ്സേജ് ബ്രോക്കേഴ്സ് ദാറ്റ് അലോസ് അസിങ്ക്രണസ് കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേഷൻസ് ആർ ദിസ് Uh, Amazon Web Services, SQS Service, Symbol Queue Service and also in the case of Microsoft Azure, uh, there is a service bus which allows you to define queues as well as the publish, subscribe, pattern, topics, topics and queues. So these, allow, uh, these are message brokers that acts like a middleware for asynchronous communication. one of the uh, main thing you remember while im- implementing the uh, grpc clients grpc mechanisms in ca- yeah, as a communication way in between your microservices uh, the core idea of this grpc like mechanism is to abstract the complexity of a remote code so they are actually hiding the network calls even though they are using the http2 and some form of serialization and all but still and a, a hiding is happening there so you should think about the that the network is actually unreliable so many of the one of the common uh problem that everyone think or everyone unaware while developing microservices architecture is that they will think like these services can communicate with each other but the reality is like networks are not reliable they can they can fail so you need to think that even though you are using grpc still it's actually a network implementation is happening behind the scene and don't expect that grpc will get a proper return uh, so you need to aware about the network issues and all when implementing and also it's actually uh, some of the times it actually uh, forces uh, some of the logic on client side so if there is a method on the server side and if you if your client don't wants to use that still uh, they need to generate that and they can either ignore that new field but still they need to regenerate that and whenever there is a change happening they need to regenerate it again on the client side whereas in the case of um the http api you can simply switch on that but still Uh, if you look into the sam newman's book on building microservices you can see that uh, he mentioned some of the uh, different advantages that this rpc remote procedure call brings to microservices and um he's he mentioned like he's he's interested in knowing more about this and uh, at places we can use it but one should be careful uh otherwise restore graphql will be a good fit for that and for clients like mobile devices it is recommended to use the graphql actually graphql is a call aggregation and filtering mechanism so in the context of a microservice architecture uh, it would be used to aggregate calls over multiple downstream microservices but it's it not replace a microservice to microservice communication um so there is an another pattern also they are called the back end for front end pattern or the bff pattern where it aggregates 
the different uh, survey uh, different uh, api returns and shows that uh, to something like a dashboard or something so that part that is also useful when you want to uh, aggregate some of the informations from different uh, apis uh, from the microservices and you want to show that to a common dashboard then this uh, backend for front end pattern will be useful so different a communication mechanism exists out there to communicate between these different microservices like the uh, rest api which is the main one which majority of the microservice architectures are using and also you can leverage this graphql for aggregation or the pff pattern also in case if you are feeling okay to use grpc you can use that as well but uh, it's like some kind of um uh, technology things are embedded into that client uh, where it is using that grpc like the uh, uh, like the grpc or soap where the wsdl you need to generate a lot of code on the client side Uh, there are advantages but still, still there are some coupling happening there as well so we need to think about that and carefully use this mechanism when it comes to microservices and the next thing that uh, i like to talk about here is like the concept of database when we think about microservices um usually there is a different opinion among the use of databases in the earlier understanding of about microservices i have understood that many were telling about one can share the database among microservices but actually uh, that's not recommended by sam newman or any experts in this field so micros uh, this uh, shared database for microservices is an anti pattern which should be avoided at all cost ideally a microservice architecture should have an individual database for each service if you are sharing a micro database and using between microservices then that would be a problem it brings you to a kind of an architecture called the distributed monolith where you will get the complexity of a monolith and all the problems of a monolith plus the problems of a distributed computing because when you combine uh, when you have a different modular services which are tied to a common database actually it's kind of a distributed monolith where it has the challenges from two different areas like the mo- monolith as well as from uh, the challenges of monolith as well as the challenges that are associated with the distributed computing so it brings a lot of problem so experts are suggesting to avoid at a all cost so instead of that you can have a separate database for each modular service uh, so that creates a lot of other issues as well especially when when you think about the transactions so if you think about the database transaction of or if you are familiar with the database transaction you can understand that uh in the case of an sql like uh, database if we have a set of transactions there we can either uh, f- uh, fully complete the transaction or either we can roll back so this won't happens in case of the microservice so uh, there we need to do something else so one way is to use a pattern called uh, saga so saga means uh, it's a pattern where uh, we will be we will be uh, either completing the entire workflow or we will be reverting it back so it's just like uh, take a case of an example where we are doing an order fulfillment and there are certain events that should happen as part of that and in case if anything failed we will entirely roll back so that is called the saga pattern you can learn more about that in a different episode which i planning later or you can check out the um uh, that sam newman's book where he mentioned in the uh, 
ഫിഫ്ത്ത് ചാപ്റ്റർ വേർ ഇംപ്ലിമെൻറ്റിങ് മൈക്രോസോഫ്റ്റ് സോറി നോട്ട് ഫിഫ്ത്ത് ചാപ്റ്റർ ദ സിക്സ്ത്ത് ചാപ്റ്റർ വേർ ഇൻ ദ ഇംപ്ലിമെൻറ്റിങ് ദ വർക്ക് ഫ്ലോ ഹീസ് മെൻഷൻഡിങ് അബൌട്ട് ഇംപ്ലിമെൻറ്റിങ് ദ സാഗ സോ ഇഫ് യു ലുക്ക് ഇറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് യു യു ഗെറ്റ് എൻ ഐഡിയ അബൌട്ട് ഹൗ ടു ഇംപ്ലിമെൻറ്റ് ദ സാഗ ടു കോമ്പൻസേറ്റ് ദ ട്രാൻസാക്ഷൻ ഓഫ് എ സീക്വൽ ഡേറ്റാ ബേസ് സോ ദേ ആർ ഹി മെൻഷൻഡ് അബൌട്ട് ടു കൈൻഡ്സ് ഓഫ് സാഗാസ് ലൈക്ക് ദി ഓർക്കസ്ട്രേറ്റഡ് സാഗ ആസ് വെൽ ആസ് ദ കൊറിയോഗ്രാഫ്ഡ് സാഗ സോ ഓർക്കസ്ട്രേറ്റഡ് സാഗ ഇൻ ഓർക്കസ്ട്രേറ്റഡ് സാഗ ദ യൂസ് എ സെൻട്രൽ കോർഡിനേറ്റർ ഓർ ഓർ വി കോൾ ദാറ്റ് ആസ് എൻ ഓർക്കസ്ട്രേറ്റർ ടു ഡിഫൈൻ ദ ഓർഡർ ഓഫ് എക്സിക്യൂഷൻ ആൻഡ് ടു ട്രിഗർ എനി റിക്വയർഡ് കോമ്പൻസേഷൻ ആക്ഷൻ സോ ഇറ്റ്സ് ലൈക്ക് എ കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് എ കമാൻഡ് ആൻഡ് കൺട്രോൾ അപ്രോച്ച് ദ ഓർക്കസ്ട്രേറ്റർ കൺട്രോൾസ് വാട്ട് വിൽ ഹാപ്പൻ ഇൻ ദ എൻറ്റയർ വർക്ക് ഫ്ലോ ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് ഗെറ്റ്സ് എ ഗുഡ് ലെവൽ ഓഫ് വിസിബിലിറ്റി ഓഫ് വാട്ട് ഈസ് ഹാപ്പനിങ് ആൻഡ് ഇൻ കേസ് ഇഫ് എനിത്തിങ് ഫെയിൽസ് സേ ഫോർ എക്സാമ്പിൾ ഇൻ ദ കേസ് ഓഫ് എൻ ഓർഡർ ഫുൾഫിൽമെൻറ്റ് പ്രോസസ്സ് ഇഫ് സംതിങ് ഫെയിൽസ് ദെൻ ഇൻ ഇറ്റ് വിൽ ട്രിഗർ എ കോമ്പൻസേറ്റിംഗ് ആക്ഷൻ സോ ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് കോൾഡ് ദ കൊറിയോഗ്രാഫ്ഡ് സാഗ സോ പ്ലീസ് ചെക്ക് ഔട്ട് ദാറ്റ് ബുക്ക് ആൻഡ് യു വിൽ ഗെറ്റ് എ ഗുഡ് അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡിങ് അബൌട്ട് ദ ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് സാഗ സോ ദിസ് ഇസ് എ മച്ച് ഫോർ എ മസ്റ്റ് ഫോർ എവരി മൈക്രോ സർവീസ് ആർക്കിടെക്ചർ ഡെവലപ്പർ ദെൻ ദർ ആർ അതർ വെയ്സ് ആസ് വെൽ ലൈക്ക് ലൈക്ക് യൂസിങ് എ ഡേറ്റ ലേക്ക് ഫോർ എക്സാമ്പിൾ ഇഫ് യു ഹാവ് എ ബിക്കോസ് ഇൻ ദ കേസ് ദീസ് ആർ പ്രോബ്ലംസ് അസോസിയേറ്റഡ് വിത്ത് ഡേറ്റാ ബേസ് ബിക്കോസ് ഇൻ ദ കേസ് ഓഫ് മൈക്രോ സർവീസ് ആർക്കിടെക്ചർ വി ആർ ഹാവിങ് എ സെറ്റ് ഓഫ് ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് ഡേറ്റാ ബേസസ് ഫോർ ഈച്ച് ഈച്ച് ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് മോഡുലർ സർവീസ് ആൻഡ് സംടൈംസ് വി നീഡ് ടു അഗ്രിഗേറ്റ് ദ ഡേറ്റ ഫ്രം ഓൾ ദ ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് ഏരിയാസ് so if you want to show a read only data then there is an approach called the data lake approach where you can uh, you can um, reference all the data from different modular services to a data lake and you can create a query from that data lake so that is another approach and it works well for the um, reading data but in the case of uh, uh, transactions like if uh, there is a series of flow like uh, in the case of an amazon when we do some payment a series of flow is actually happening and in case if any flow fails then we need to revert back so because here in the microservice architecture it is happening in more different uh, different modules uh, it may not be easy like a simple database transaction rollback so here we need to use an approach like a saga so sagas are of two types as i described described like the choreographed saga as well as the orchestrated saga so you can look into that and understand more about those things uh, so that will be helpful for you and main thing you should keep in mind that you should avoid a shared database at all cost because that will bring an another kind of non recommended architecture known as distributed monolith which you should avoid at all cost you can have the general recommendation is like you can have a monolith uh, you can sometimes have modular monolith like the shopify do but you should avoid the d- distributed monolith at all cost so distributed monolith is what happening when you use something like a shared database for um microservices so the i think i covered some of the the time is going above one hour so plan to cover other advanced um or uh, it's not advanced topic but some of the related area topics like the uh, uh, saga patterns in more detail and also some of the build and pipeline consideration because we just talked about the microservice development uh, as a basic understanding you can have a build and release pipeline which you can set using the different yeah using the different uh, devops mechanism some of the popular devops mechanism are azure devops gitlabs then many are there uh, so you can based on the if our organization requirement then you can set the different uh, build and 
deployment pipeline the key thing to remember is that independent deployability should be there when defining the build and release pipelines and also uh, the at the workflow of the microservice architecture goes like this you ideally develop a microservice uh, in your local development environment you check in the code once you've done the local development to a source control which in fact trigger a pipeline and once that build pipeline has been triggered a set of test will be running there so first initially there will be a compile test which is very fast and then there will be a set of slow test which usually occurs in the ca environment and then uh, as a uh, then there can be different uh, environments like the qa production and all and associated um, uh, different um, approval areas are there and based on that that will be deployed to the production so that depends on upon how we configure these things so um ideally uh, uh you can have a copy you can have a copy of uh, the uh, environment in for your uh, in your local developer laptop by installing the docker container so the if you most probably you will be developing applications uh, using the docker form of development and then you can install the docker locally and then you can run it inside the visual studio there will be provision so if you are develop, if you are using a dotnet core as a uh, platform for developing microservice modules then you can run it in, from inside the visual studio and if you inst- install the docker service it will be automatically you can have the option to run it inside the docker uh, container as well from inside the developer laptop from there you can check in to the source code and then it will be deployed from the build and deployment pipelines to different environments like ca qa and production so each environment varies so the main uh some of the main things you should consider while configuring the deployment is like uh, the uh, each microservice should be running in an isolated fashion so that they have their own computing resources and execution and one execution does not impact the other microservices so containers will be a good fit for that because uh, each microservice can run in its own container and even if there is something problem happens inside that container it will be crashed and another container can be created provided if you have mechanisms like kubernetes in place then uh, infrastructure as a code kind of deployment is the one you should worth consider because that will help you to easily automate all the different task as well as you can store the entire infrastructure inside the source control so that it will help you to create the environments easily um then uh, these are some of the things main things you should consider then you can have uh, the uh, you can deploy the container de- deploy the microservices in different areas so you can deploy that inside a physical machine a virtual machine or inside a container so a container is the preferred way because that offers a low lower cost and faster provisioning but while if you install inside a virtual machine the cost will be much higher but you can have you can install it there is a way but mostly for microservice architecture and its deployment container would be a preferred choice and most of the time uh, organization take advantage of services like azure kubernetes services or amazon uh, kubernetes services where we tell the kubernetes services that we need a cluster with this much resources and all and we supply the container images and rest of that automatically the uh, the the um uh, that service will be taken care of so it's kind of an 
on-demand service where you define to that service what you want and the stored things will be taken care of by that container by that kubernetes service itself also there is another way of deployment for this uh, microservices which is nowadays getting popular which is called the serverless or function as a service where you define these different microservices as a function and using the services in a, in cloud like the azure functions or the uh, aws lambda you can create the different functions as a service uh, which will ideally be a dif- individual microservice in effect and that can also work behind the scene so these are the things i plan to cover in this episode we will be discussing more about other types of uh, other other types of uh, details about this microservice architecture related technologies like the build uh, what type of build pipeline you can set what type of testing you can implement here and also some of the maintenance part like the a uh, logging and aggregation mechanism all that in a different episode i hope this is a basic episode will give you a uh, just an overview picture of uh, what the microservice service is all about so if you are interested in learning more about the microservice architecture i recommend you to go through the book by sam newman which is called building microservices so second edition is available now it's from orally publication and also there is a book called excellent book called microservices up and running which is also from the same orally publication you can check out that so thank you for listening this podcast i will be coming up with another podcast soon so do check out my youtube channel as well as the meetup group there are different cloud related sessions out there thank you once again for listening this podcast have a great day ahead